What's up everybody? I'm Tim from Timber Ridge Gifts and welcome to my question and answer video. So a few weeks ago I held a contest to celebrate my 20,000 subscriber milestone and the entry method for that contest was in the comment section of that video. You either had to ask a question or suggest a new video for me to do. I got an overwhelming response, way too many questions for me to actually sit down and answer each one individually. So what I've done is gone through and selected some of the more popular ones. We're going to answer those today. Hopefully one of the questions you ask is one of the ones I answer today. And depending on how this goes, this may be something I do once a month or so. But let's quit wasting time talking about it and start answering questions. So one of the most popular questions I got was about the wick bars that I use in my different videos. Now really just about anything can be used as a wick bar. Something to hold your wick in place from a clothespin to an ink pen to just any type of a metal or wooden skewer. Really if it works, it's not wrong. You can DIY or homemade just about anything. And really, if it holds your wick in place and you're happy with it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's going to work just fine for you, so roll with it. But there are a lot of aftermarket wick bars, and I've got just a sample laid out of some of the ones that I've used in my different videos. The uh, first one's going to be just the, uh, the plain slotted wick bar. Most of you have probably seen these. You can buy these just about anywhere. They're fairly common. Uh, next is going to be the Bowtie Wick Bar. Again, these are fairly common. You can buy these just about anywhere from candle supply stores to the different hobby supply stores. Uh, I do have a couple of my videos that a lot of people were really interested in. We're going to zoom in to check those out. So the first one I've got is this one here. Um, a lot of people will have trouble finding these. I think the problem is, is these aren't actually called Wick Bars. For some reason, uh, different supply companies call these Wick Centering Tools. I guess they want it to sound more fancy. I'm not sure why they don't just call it a wick bar, but perhaps when people go to the different supply sites, if they're entering wick bar into the search option, they may not be able to find these. So the next time you go to a candle supply company, try searching wick centering tool or wick centering device. Perhaps these will come up. Uh, these I got from Keystone Candle Supply. These are slightly less common than some of the other ones. You can't find them in different places. I know Bitter Creek Candle Supply has some. They're currently out of stock. Uh, I know you can buy these on eBay. I think I've seen them on Amazon before. But the best price I've found have been the ones that I buy from Keystone Candle Supply. They have a small, medium, and large. This is the medium. It will fit the 8-ounce candle tin. And these are sized mainly for the candle tins. The small will fit the 2-ounce candle tin, and the large will fit the 16-ounce. They don't really match up too well with mason jars, but if you're making candle tins, these are a great tool to have. Basically, just slide your wick through the center. It's already the perfect size to grab onto the sides. If you wanted to get your wick a little bit tighter, it does have the uh, little catch right there where you can actually wrap your wick around it. That holds everything in place. You can pour, manipulate it, it's not going anywhere. But the one people seem to be most interested in is this one right here. This one, the only place I've ever seen this for sale. I'm sure other places sell it, but the only place I've ever seen it where I got it was Bitter Creek Candle Supply. These are designed specifically for mason jars. I've only seen them in this size. They will fit the regular mouth mason jars. I've not seen any for the wide mouth. So if any of you have, please feel free to share that in the comments so everybody else can look for them too. These are super simple to use. Basically they'll just fit perfectly right on top of the mason jar. Your wick will clip into the slot. And you're ready to pour. And one of the coolest features about these is the lid can actually be put on top of these. So let's say you wanted to uh, put the lid on these while they cooled. You can trim your wick, and the lid's going to fit right over it. Once your candle cures, take all that off, and it's ready to go out the door. So hopefully that was helpful. I know a lot of people saw those in my videos and asked about them, especially that black one. So again, the links are in the video description. Make sure you guys check those out. So let's check out some more of the questions I got. I'm just going to pull these from the comment section of my YouTube channel. I'm going to put them up on screen so you guys can see them. This person commented that they'd like to see testing of the same fragrance oil in different waxes. So I thought about doing that. That may be a video I do in the future. Um, it would be interesting to see, but I don't really know what information that would give us other than which wax would work best for that particular fragrance oil. If I were to do 10 different fragrance oils, each in 10 different waxes, and the same wax was the best each time, that might tell us something. That may be something I'll look at in the future, but it's a great question. I'd be curious to know the answer to. Uh, this person, congratulations, been a subscriber for a while. Would love to see more about making candles. You are in the right place. She would also like to see shea butter, coconut oil, or even CBD oil. 
Those first two can be used in certain candle making applications. Most commonly in massage candles, um, they wouldn't really have much benefit in any other type of candle. As far as the CBD oil goes, don't have a lot of experience with it. I've never actually held any in my hand or even done any type of experimenting with it. The only reference I do have is from the uh, Tennessee Soap and Candle Makers Convention I went to. Um, one of the speakers there had a huge candle and bath and body product business based solely around CBD oil. Had everything from CBD oil lip gloss to CBD oil bath bombs, hand lotion, shampoo, conditioner. Pretty much anything you could think of to put CBD oil in, except candles. The reason being, they said once the uh, CBD oil was burned off in a candle, there was really no benefit to it. Uh, you couldn't smell it as it burned off. It wasn't something that once vaporized by the candle that you could breathe in and receive some type of benefit from it. So honestly, I think if you were to put that in your candle, you'd probably just be wasting your money. Again, I've never tried it, but the person who had a business making a million dollars a year selling everything with CBD oil, wasn't selling CBD oil candles. Probably a reason for that. And the next question is, can a blow dryer be used instead of a heat gun? Uh, she's talking about either, forget which video this is from, it's either from the uh, marble candle video or just the uh, tips and tricks video showing how to get rid of frosting. Either way, the idea is still the same. Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, technically it can. It's going to take forever and a day, if it even gets hot enough. And depending on how much you're using it, a hair dryer has a lot more air output than a heating gun. So if you were to get the top of your candle liquefied, you're going to have a lot more airflow across the top of that candle. You may end up blowing some out of the container. So yes, technically it can work. If that's all you have, that's all you have access to. And the budget is so tight that you can't afford anything else. It can be used, but the first chance you get, I would look into getting a good heat gun. Um, you can get them at your local hardware store, anywhere from 10 to $15. I think that's why a lot of people ask that, because they have no experience with tools. They really don't know what it actually costs, but it's probably one of the cheapest tools you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot. And you don't need a big fancy one with four or five settings, just the cheapest one they have will work. Um, really $10, $12. They're not that expensive. It's definitely something I would invest in. This person asked, I want to start making candles. My question is, can I use old vegetable or soup cans? Technically, you can, yeah. More often than not, it's a uh, tin or aluminum can. I would make sure there's no type of lining built into the can. I have seen some that have some sort of weird uh, wax paper insulation type. Definitely wouldn't want something in there that's going to be able to catch fire and burn. Um, another thing, the, a plain can is not going to be treated like a candle container would be. A lot of the candle tins you can buy, they're actually sealed on the inside. And that is to actually prevent a chemical change in the metal when the fragrance oil reacts with the metal. It's going to look like rust. It's not actually rust, but it's pretty much what it looks like. That's what everybody calls it. But basically, some fragrance oils are caustic enough that they will tarnish the inside of the candle container. So keep in mind that the can's not going to have that in it. A uh, quick and easy thing to do would be just coat the inside of it with Mod Podge. I do that with a lot of my candle containers anyway, just because the liner's not always good enough. So short answer is, sure, they can be used. Make sure that you take the extra step to seal them, and make sure there's nothing in there that's going to be flammable. This person asks, I would like to see how to pour fragrance oils without spilling them. That can be a big problem if you're trying to get super precise or if you're just pouring it into a smaller container. You don't want to overpour, you don't want to underpour, and you definitely don't want to spill any because that stuff's pretty expensive. A couple different ways I know of that you can do that. First is going to be these little pouring spouts. It's a cap with a pouring spout built into it. Some different supply companies actually supply these with their fragrance oil bottles. I know Aztec does. There might be a couple other that I can't think of offhand. A couple others actually sell these. A lot of the other packaging supply companies sell these for use in different applications such as shampoos and hand soaps. But they're really quite simple. You basically just replace the cap of your fragrance oil with these, turn up the spout, and just pour out your fragrance oil. And the great thing about these, these are reusable. If you wash them out really well once this fragrance oil is out, I could wash this up and reuse it on a different bottle. But unless they come with the fragrance oil that you buy, there is a cost associated with them. I know the few places I've seen them for sale, they go anywhere from 10 to 15 cents a piece. They can add up depending on what size fragrance oil collection you have. It's another cheap and easy way to do it is just get a uh, plastic pipette. You can also buy these from a lot of different supply companies, uh, mainly the ones that sell soap making supplies. And these are quite simple. You just Pipe out how much you need. 
Then you can just transfer it to your wax that way. And I will admit that both of those are a whole lot easier than trying to do this. That likes to curl back on you. And you'll end up spilling it or it runs down the side. It can be pretty messy and wasteful. Alright, Don asks, I'm just starting out with my candle making and stumbled upon your videos. Welcome. I was wondering, could you talk a little about your testing procedures and what kind of notes you take for that? I have done a few uh, testing videos so far. Make sure you check out my wick testing video. I've done a few of those, both with cotton wicks and wood wicks. And I may do one in the future on note taking. Uh, for now, you definitely should check out my Facebook group, Candle Makers Club. Uh, the link is in the video description. There is actually a file in the file section. It is a spreadsheet that one of my members did. And it's actually very useful. I've actually started using it uh, since this person posted it. So even if you have your own, it's definitely worth checking out. Again, just join the Facebook group. If you're already in the Facebook group and you haven't checked out the file section, there's a few great things in there. Definitely worth checking out. Dana asks, which ounce sells the best for you? Well, that's obviously going to differ for everyone. Um, if you're asking me personally, I mainly sell the 8-ounce candles. Just because I do 90% of my selling online, I have found that those have the best balance to be able to sell online. They're basically the biggest size I can sell for the most money and still ship rather cheaply. Uh, if I made a 16-ounce candle, I could charge more for that, obviously. It would probably sell well, but shipping on it would be double what the 8-ounce is. So when you sell online, you got to find that balance. A person may not have a problem buying a $20 candle, but they don't want to pay $9 to have that candle shipped. So that same person may be okay buying a $12 candle because it only costs $3 to ship it. So you got to find that balance, whatever works for you. If you sell mainly at farmer's markets, people may like that bigger size. The 16-ounce may do well for you. If you sell mainly party favors or wedding favors, maybe a 2-ounce or a 4-ounce is going to work best for you. So the answer is going to differ for everybody, but if you're asking me personally, I almost strictly sell the 8-ounce candles. Uh, this person asks, is it more expensive to buy pre-made fragrance oil or is it cheaper to make your own similar scent? I guess he's talking about making his own fragrance oils versus buying the bottle from the fragrance oil company. Um, really depends how you look at it. Um, to buy a 16 ounce bottle of fragrance oil from Lone Star Candle Supply, it's going to be $16.95 I believe is what their pound goes for. So if you were to make that on your own, if you knew how, if you figured it all out, um, Eventually, you're going to reach a point where you can make it cheaper than Lone Star sells it for. But you're going to have to really scale to get to that point. Because to make your own, first of all, you're going to have to know how. So that's going to take a lot of testing, a lot of experimenting for each individual scent. So that's a lot of money right there. Uh, then, once you buy all of your supplies to actually make your own fragrance oil, of course, you're going to have to buy those in bulk to get your pricing down. So... If you mastered it, if you were able to do it, if you bought it in bulk, you would probably have to make upwards of, you know, two or three hundred pounds before to get your per pound price lower than what you can get it for from Lone Star Campbell Supply. So yes, it can be done, but you're really going to have to bring it to the scale to where that's what you do for your business. You're your own candle supply company, basically, making and selling your own fragrance oils. Uh, if you were to scale to that point, yeah, you can get your prices down, but just normal people doing it in their candle shops or their kitchens, um, there's no way that you could actually get through all of your testing, get in all of your supplies at smaller quantities, and produce a pound of fragrance oil for cheaper than what you could buy it for from a candle supply company. Kay asks, could you show me how to make beeswax candles? I thought a ton of people asked me that. That is definitely on the list. I uh, can't say when, maybe next week, maybe the week after that. But very soon I will definitely be doing a uh, beeswax tutorial. So their question is, because I have put together many pens that start with kits or specialty blanks, do these sellers also need to be listed in my Etsy shop? Uh, what she's talking about is in the Etsy listing there's a section for production partners. And that is where you would credit someone that has helped you bring your finished product uh, to the marketplace. However, it's not quite that broad. What that's really referencing is... Say I sold a candle and soap uh, combo kit and I took my gunpowder candle and a gunpowder scented soap that I got from a soap maker friend of mine. Put those two together and sell that as a gift set. In that instance, yes, that person that made the soap would have to be listed as a production partner 
because their finished product helped bring my finished product to the marketplace. Uh, that production partner section is not referring to someone who supplies you with your supplies. Basically, if you take something that they give you and you do anything to it to turn it into a finished product, then they're just referenced as a supplier and they don't actually count as a production partner. So Lauren makes pins, obviously. So if you buy the pin blank, uh, you put it on your lathe, you turn it, you actually shape it into the finished product. That's just you uh, finishing up a supply. Uh, much like I melt down wax, add fragrance oil and dye, those all come to me as finished supplies, but I take further action to turn them into a finished product that I then try to sell. So the short answer to her and anybody else in a similar situation is no, you don't have to list your blank supplier as a production partner. That's strictly a supplier-consumer relationship, not a uh, production co-op. Uh, Justine says she would like to see ideas for candles as wedding favors. Those aren't really candles that I make personally. I have seen a ton of those. If you're just looking for inspiration, just uh, go to Google Images, uh, go to Pinterest. There's a ton of them there. The thing about wedding favors is appeal of those is more in the design and the presentation than the actual candle itself. So they're usually in two ounce tins. And the thing about them is, yeah, people are going to look and say, oh, it's a candle. They might smell it. If it smells good, they're, they're going to be a lot happier about it. But outside of that, they don't really care that it's a candle. They're more interested in what the label says. You know, the bride is usually the one that buys these. Uh, she wants it to be in the wedding colors. She wants it to be in a specific script. Uh, she might want it to say something very specific. So if you're looking to make these, definitely take the time to make a proper candle. But in the long run, your time and your effort is going to be better spent in the uh, labeling and the design rather than the actual candle itself. And she asks, I would love to see you try sending a candle with essential oils. I've never tried it, but I heard it doesn't work very well. It can be hit or miss. Um, a lot of people will use essential oils just so they can have that uh, all-natural or non-synthetic label. And in some circles, that may be a great selling point for them. Um, I generally don't use essential oils just because, like you've heard, they don't really work well. They can work. The problem with them is, is the uh, fragrance load ratio is pretty much the same as with fragrance oils. So to achieve a specific scent throw with fragrance oils, and you would use a 10% fragrance load, to achieve that same hot throw with essential oils, you're also going to need a 10% fragrance load. So the fragrance load ratio is the same, but the price is definitely not. Some essential oils can sell for upwards of $25 to $30 an ounce. Uh, even the cheapos that you can buy at uh, TJ Maxx or Marshalls, those are still $6, $7 an ounce. So in the long run, other than being able to say that they're made with pure essential oils, you're not really doing yourself any other favors, and you're spending about three to four times the money. Not to mention essential oils are kind of keyholed into a smaller uh, selection base, whereas with fragrance oils, you can get a fragrance oil of just about any scent you can possibly imagine. So for my money, I'm going to pick fragrance oils over essential oils 100% of the time. And they say, I really appreciate the valuable information you share. Definitely my pleasure. Could you do a video on display and presentation ideas for craft shows, flea markets, etc.? I actually started to do that video a while back, had everything set up, got out there with my camera, realized it was February and I was freezing my butt off, and there was no way I was going to be able to do a 20 minute video outside. So I packed all that up, brought it inside. Uh, hopefully now that it's warmer outside, I'll try that video again and hopefully I'll be able to get that posted for you before the craft show season starts this fall. Kimberly asks, can you do a video on making smokeless container candles? Might need her to be a little bit more specific. Um, if they're made properly, uh, no container candle should smoke. If you've got it wicked properly, if you've got your wick trimmed, if you don't have anything in there that shouldn't be in there, soy wax with a cotton core wick, as long as it's maintained properly, it's not going to smoke on you. So, Kimberly, if you're watching, if you meant something different, uh, please clarify it for us. But if not, just uh, watch a few of my tutorials. Uh, once a candle is made properly, it's going to be smokeless. There's nothing extra you have to do to it. Amanda says, Tim, I love your videos. I would love to see your videos on movie-themed candles. I want to see your favorite movie. I want to see what your favorite character in a movie is. And you could do a theme on a game board that you like. I think it would be cool to express yourself through candle design and color. 
Well, since you asked, my favorite movie is Pirates of the Caribbean. Pretty much any one from the series. I guess if I had to pick one, I would say the first one. Don't really know what a Pirates of the Caribbean themed candle would, would uh, look like or smell like. Um, if you guys have any ideas, feel free to let me know. Um, I brought that question up because I want to bring up the point to uh, make sure if you are making and selling candles like that, uh, make sure that you don't commit any type of uh, copyright or trademark infringement. I could skirt the boundaries a little bit on doing that. Let's say I made an ocean scented one and I called it The Black Pearl or A Pirate's Life. Something that obviously referenced that movie but wasn't something specifically taken from the movie. Like obviously I couldn't make a candle and call it Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, probably couldn't make one and call it Captain Jack Sparrow. It's something you have to really research and be careful about because some of these companies protect their trademarks and their copyrights aggressively, especially Disney. If you pop up on their radar and Disney catches you violating any of their trademark restrictions, they will thump you on the head in a hurry. So that's definitely something to look into. You can uh, end up getting sued or at least lose a lot of money in supplies and branding that you put into it. Uh, something similar and unfortunate happened to a lot of people that made Harry Potter themed items. Um, for years, J.K. Rowling owned the rights to Harry Potter, and she didn't protect her copyrights or trademarks at all. She really didn't care if anybody made Harry Potter themed items. Uh, she was making her money writing her books. Didn't really care what anybody else did. You could make a candle call. J.K. Rowling said I could make this. She wouldn't have cared. Then the rights were sold to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers cared. So they sent their team of lawyers to Etsy, Amazon Handmade, pretty much anywhere else people were selling these Harry Potter themed items. So, worst case scenario, you're going to get sued for royalties. Uh, even best case scenario, you're going to get a really nasty C&D letter and you're going to have to take down all the products that you made. So definitely research and make sure that you're not violating anybody's trademark or copyright. And Melissa asks, is the wooden wicks that you cut off, can you use those for making other candles if they're long enough to fit in the candle? Uh, what she's talking about, let's say you have a 8 inch wooden wick or cotton wick, uh, you put it in a jar that's only three inches tall. So you cut off the excess and you've got like that much wick left over. You can buy the metal tabs that come on the bottom of your pre-made wicks. Uh, if I were to use this in a four ounce jar, obviously going to have a lot left over. So once I cut that off, I could just take a new tab, slide the wick up through it, crimp the bottom of it, and I'd have a brand new wick. Uh, same can be done with wooden wicks. And depending on how much extra time you want to spend doing it, you can save yourself a little bit of money. Um, a wick this size, Costs roughly seven cents a piece. Wick tabs are generally three cents a piece. So I can reuse it, have two wicks for 10 cents rather than 14 cents. Every little bit helps, so if you've got the time, definitely worth giving it a shot. So the last question to answer will hopefully encompass a lot of questions that were asked um, probably 10 times a day. Somebody will either ask me if I have done or will suggest that I do a video on ABC. Well, turns out if they were familiar with my channel, they would already see that I've already done two or three videos on ABC. But if they haven't been with me from the beginning, they wouldn't have known that. They weren't around for that video. And I think now I've got 170-something videos on my channel. So obviously they're not going to search through 10 pages of videos to try to find that video. But what a lot of people don't realize is that every YouTube page has a search function. All you have to do is go to my YouTube homepage and look for the little hourglass. Click on that. That opens up a search bar. You can type in what you're looking for. And it'll bring up all the videos on my channel that have video tags related to that specific topic. It's going to look just like this. Just thought I would bring that up. A lot of people don't realize that's there. Uh, not that I don't mind answering all those questions, but if I get 10 or so a day, I really don't have time to uh, go to a video, copy the link, go back to the comment section, drop that link for that person. So hopefully if there's a video that you're curious about, you can uh, find it that way. Or if you just want to search through the videos and want to be a little bit more specific in your search, even if you've been here for a while, just go to that search bar, type in the topic you're looking for. Hopefully a video will come up. Hope you guys enjoy this Q&A video. Probably going to try to do a few more of these throughout the year. Um, I used to be able to sit down on the keyboard and answer each question individually, but the channel's growing to the point and so many questions are being asked between my Facebook group, personal emails, some people will reach out through Etsy, and the questions in the comment section. It's a little hard to go across every platform and answer every question 
inevitably some are going to get missed. When my channel was smaller, it was easy to keep up with, but now there are 21,000 of you, so it's a little harder to keep up. Definitely love your questions. Keep them coming. I'm just probably going to have to adjust fire and find different ways to be able to answer everybody. So you guys make sure you subscribe to my channel. Turn on the notification bell so you'll know when new videos come out. Make sure to check out all my playlists. Check out all the links in the video description. Thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you next time.